skeleton of the hand. As one can see, hand appears to be quite a complicated structure. Of course it needs to be complicated because just take a look and try to identify number of different movements that each and every one of us will perform any day of our lives. Whether it would be holding a pencil, whether it would be typing on a keyboard of our computers, or performing some kind of truly nice, detailed, sophisticated type of work, or perhaps holding a pickaxe and doing a little bit of work in the backyard. For any of these activities, hand appears to be perfect fit. It is composed of three different sets of bones that are traditionally named bones of the carpal region or carpal bones. There is a total of eight bones within the carpal region. Then we have five bones that are hidden within our palm and they are called metacarpal bones. Finally, a skeleton of our fingers or digits which is composed of bones that are individually named as phalanx and using the plural term phalanges. There will be five bones within the metacarpal region and 14 phalanges forming the skeleton of our five fingers or five digits. It is not easy to show the bones of the carpal region unless you have freshly dissected specimen where arrangement between these bones has been left quite intact due to presence of ligaments that bind these bones and hold them together. Regardless, let's try to see how much we can learn from this video. There are eight bones within the carpal region and they are arranged in two rows. Proximal row made of four and a distal row which is also made of four bones. Their names are as it follows. First comes the scaphoid bone and it is located as the most lateral bone in the proximal row. Next to it is the lunate. Next to lunate comes triquetrum. And finally the little bone which sits practically within the palm and becomes one of these easily palpable structures is the pisiform. So the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum and the pisiform assemble the proximal row. Distal row of bones is made of four bones as well. Let's try to zoom in a little bit to see their features a bit better. First bone is known as the trapezium. Next to trapezium comes the trapezoid bone. That's the trapezoid. Then we have the capitate and finally there is a bone which has a bit of a projection into the palm that is known as the hamate bone. So distal row is trapezium, trapezoid, capitate and hamate. These bones as they are held together by fairly strong ligaments practically form the floor of the carpal tunnel and on each side of the floor we would have two prominent landmarks. The scaphoid bone will have its own tubercle and also we are going to find a tubercle of the trapezium. So these two elevations will offer attachment point for the ligament which runs as the roof over the carpal tunnel and the name for the ligament is transverse carpal ligament. Also in many books the same structure is given a different name it is known as the retinaculum flexorum, the net which is stretched out over the tendon of flexor muscles that pass through the carpal tunnel in order to reach the skeleton of the hand, whether it is on the carpals, metacarpals or on the phalanges. On the medial side, there are also two elevations that will be used for attachment of the transverse carpal ligament. One of them, of course, is the pisiform bone and the other one that we have is the hook or the hamulus of the hamate bone. This is the left side scaphoid bone observed by itself. The name scaphoid actually translates into a little boat. As you can see the boat is really not exactly as what we would imagine to have a boat but some of these names are just given as nice approximation. So that is the scaphoid 
and as you can see far left there is a tubercle of the scaphoid bone. Here we can see articular surface through which the scaphoid bone will make the contact with the distal radius and that is going to be one of the two bones of the carpal region the scaphoid and the lunate bone which is next to it that make direct contact with the direct distal radius. This is a lunate bone. La luna as we know means moon and this bone has a very easy to recognize crescent moon shape. This is trapezium bone on its own. As one can see there is a nice articular surface that will offer support for the base of the first metacarpal bone. If I tilt the bone just slightly I hope that I would be able to show you that this truly looks like a saddle which runs in one direction concave but also when we see it from different direction it is a convex articular surface. That's why we're gonna have first carpo metacarpal joint to be one of the best examples of a saddle joint. So this bone that is trapezium. This is the largest bone of the carpal group. Its name is capitate because this superiorly oriented projection looks like a head so practically its name means the bone with a head, the capitate bone which is the third bone in the distal row of carpals. And finally let's take a look at this bone that is hamate bone the last one in the distal row of carpal bones. Easy to identify it as it has very large projection that is known as the hook or the hamulus and that one is projecting into the palm on the medial side of it of course. Metacarpal bones. Within the palm we would have five metacarpal bones. They're simply numbered as first, second, third, fourth and fifth metacarpal bones. As for the carpal bones, whenever we prefer to list them, we tend to go lateral to medial direction. In the hand it is pretty much easy to accept why lateral to medial approach has been assumed because we consider that first digit, the thumb, is the most mobile of all five digits and therefore it has a little bit more of a role for adding quality of the movement so in the hand we go lateral to medial as within the skeleton of the foot we'll have a different approach medial to lateral because that is position of a big toe. There are five metacarpal bones and each and every of them is described in exactly the same form they have their bases that are used to form joints or articulations with a distal row of carpal bones. First joint, first carpo metacarpal joint is most loose, that is the saddle joint between trapezium and the base of the first metacarpal bone. However, other carpo metacarpal joints for metacarpal bones 2, 3, 4 and 5 will offer way less mobility. So bases are used to make contact between five metacarpal bones and a distal row of carpals. From base we can see the long shaft of these five bones. So these are shafts or bodies and these bones are frequently described as being long bones in miniature. Finally the most prominent part especially when we clench the fist and when we want to show it, it is this part of the metacarpal bone which becomes quite prominent and of course they form the knuckles. In anatomy we simply call them the heads of metacarpal bones. Each of the five would be described in perfectly same form, the base, the body or shaft and finally the most distal part, the head. These are just bases of five metacarpal bones positioned properly next to each other without carpal bones obstructing the view. So we can see here on the far left side in the corner that we have articular surface on the base of the first metacarpal bone which is also shaped like convex, concave and of course it will be a good match for same type of articular surface on the trapezium. 
other four bases are going to be more flat and this is the base of the second, the third, the fourth and finally the fifth metacarpal bone. If we continue just to see a little bit more in the inferior direction we can see their bodies and finally their rounded heads that complete the presentation of this group of bones. Finally, the skeleton of our fingers. There are five fingers, however Latin terms do not dis differentiate between fingers and toes. Latin word for end parts of both hand and the foot is simply digits. Within the hand, digits are named. So first digit or thumb is called the pollex. Second finger is known as the index. Third finger is named digitus medius. Then we have finger number four, digitus annularis. And finally, the fifth finger, digitus minimus. Each of the fingers is composed of bones that are individually termed phalanx, multiples are phalanges, and typical finger is composed of three phalanges, the proximal, the middle, and distal phalanx. Only exception to this rule is the thumb, which only has two phalanges, the proximal and distal. Phalanges are also described on a very broad generic terms, so we would have each of these 14 bones described in practically the same form, identifying as its most proximal part, the base, then following the body or shaft, and finally the most distal part of the bone is the head. Regardless whether you describe the proximal, middle, or distal phalanx of either of the fingers, you will describe it in the same form, the base, the body, and the head. The only difference is, as we mentioned it earlier, the thumb having just two phalanges, so therefore this one is proximal, this one is distal, whereas other fingers would have three, the proximal, the middle, and finally the distal phalanx. So let's recap what we have learned today about skeleton of the hand. There are three groups of bones, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. There are eight bones in a group of carpals, and when we start listing them, we go lateral to medial direction, scaphoid, lunate, trichvetrum, and episiform. Distal row of carpals is trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. There will be multiple joints that are formed between radius and carpal bones, as well as in between carpal bones. Although in the past each of these joints were described individually, it is a little bit easier concept to talk about radiocarpal joint, which is formed between distal radius, scaphoid, and lunate bone then we can have plenty of intercarpal joints, all of them being synovial, all of them assuring that there would be some minimal gliding and sliding type of movement to adjust position of carpal bones for a variety of different movements that the hand will produce. In between proximal and distal row of carpals, perhaps we can mention here one larger joint cavity which forms the mid-carpal joint, so it is assembled between bones of the proximal versus bones of the distal row of carpals. At this level, when carpal bones meet bases of metacarpals, we already mentioned it, we are going to have series of joints that are called the carpo-metacarpal joints. First one is truly exception because it's a saddle joint ensuring that the thumb would have a variety of different movement to perform, especially when compared to movement that affects other four metacarpal bones. The thumb can be easily flexed and extended at this biaxial joint, but also could be brought in and out of the palm, which will result in our ability to do movement of the thumb, which is called the opposition. Five bones of the carpal region, counted also lateral to medial direction from first to fifth, are described as having their bases, their shafts, and of course, part which will be most prominent when we clenched our hands into a fist, 
their heads of metacarpal bones. There will be a total of 14 phalanges. Each finger, with the exception of thumb, is composed of two, uh, three phalanges. Thumb is only made of two, proximal and distal. On index finger, we can see proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Regardless of phalanges to which finger they belong, whether it's to pollex, index, medius, annularis, or digitus minimus, each phalanx is described in the same form, having its base, then the shaft, and finally the head of the phalanx.